Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-founder and sometimes co-host of The Break It Down Show. Our guest today is Vincent Darby. He's a young, soulful singer from Birmingham, England, which of course has always been a source of great music. Acts from Birmingham run the gamut, from Black Sabbath and Judas Priest to Duran Duran and Dexy's Midnight Runners. The Spencer Davis Group, ELO, Steve Winwood, UB40, The Fine Young Cannibals. Birmingham is a place that offers a lot of influences. Now add classic R&B, neo-soul, gospel, and reggae, and you get just the start of Vincent Darby's musical DNA. I should say that you can get more info on him at officialvincentdarby.com or follow him on Insta at officialvincentdarby. And before we get to Vincent, let me mention... Save the Brave. Savethebrave.org. We support their mission to help veterans cope with PTSD, and we would love it if you help too, especially in the midst of this pandemic. Save the Brave is going strong at a time when we all could use a little more support and fellowship, so please consider lending some of your support to Save the Brave. And if you're wondering why you're hearing my voice, it's probably because you heard that I'm stepping down from the Break It Down show to develop new joints for Lions Rock Productions, specifically Focus on the Funk. It's a show about music and people who make music, and it's a lot different from what you hear out there. So give me a minute. We're still in development, but definitely stay with us. I'm launching the show soon. And of course, if you like books and science and comedians and baseball and spy stuff, the Break It Down show will continue to deliver with Pete at the helm. I'll be focused on the funk, so stay tuned. I'm also producing an audiobook for Dr. Andrea Vitz, who wrote The You You've Never Met, and I'm co-hosting her podcast, Level-Headed Talk, and I'm co-hosting the Ted O'Neill program with the world's best strength and rehab coach, Ted O'Neill. Both of those are available on Apple Podcasts and everywhere you find fitness and self-improvement podcasts. So I'm still helping out here on the Break It Down show. And Pete is the captain of the ship. But keep an ear out for other upcoming shows. I'd really love your support on those. And speaking of support, follow Official Vincent Darby on Instagram or go to officialvincentdarby.com to hear his tracks. Read more after you listen to our show today with our guest, the smooth and soulful Vincent Darby. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitch Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. I'm Vincent Darby, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed, and we're excited to have Vincent Darby on. Vincent Darby is a soul singer. He's, uh, well, raised in Birmingham, but his family's from Jamaica. So let's start there. Let's say you get, and you've built a, a head of steam, and we'll get into all of that for our audience, but let's say you sign a major label deal right now, and they go, look, we want you to build your musical empire, and yeah. you've got some choices. You can base that thing in Birmingham. You can base it in Kingston. Or you can go to New York or L.A. Where do you start? Well, first and foremost, I actually don't enjoy L.A. Like, I okay. just, when I was there, I just thought it was so overrated. I thought, like, growing up being British, I feel like you grow up and you see, like, TV and you think, yeah, this is going to be great. Like, it's going to be <laughs> an incredible place. And then you're stuck in traffic for, like, three hours to get 20 minutes in yeah. a car. And it's like, wow, this is just not necessary. New York, if they said like either a place, either New York or Toronto, I love them cities so much. This oh, we no throw Toronto in the mix. Yeah, this is no exaggeration about LA. There's helicopter traffic. This is what I mean. Like, I just don't get the pretense of it. Like, I understand why people want to live there because it is, it is really cool. Like, there's nowhere else in the world where you can go hike in the desert, go and look at some skyscrapers and see the sea. Like, it's mad, but. But it's also the, oh, yeah. the travel. It's terrible. That's a tremendous but. <laughs> it's it's literally the biggest one. Like I feel like if I moved there, I'd have to learn to like ride like a motorcycle or something because that traffic is just not the one. Let that me just not- tell you, some guy who's an accountant for a high end firm or whatever, that guy can ride a motorcycle through traffic. You can't because you've got to be able to show up every day. You know, it, it is faster. You just got to hire someone to drive for you, and you just do shit in the car in the back because yeah. you, you can't risk getting clipped by a car. And that happens 
every damn day on the freeway out here. Every day. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. I can imagine. Why do you think it is that English know soul music and American soul music better than Americans? Do you think so? Yes. I think so? I, yes. Yeah. I really, really don't. I don't. Honestly, that's that shocked me a little bit. I I think that British soul music is slightly different. Like I think that like the, I don't know. I think that because the weather's so bad here, I feel like we have to create comfort in something, and I think that that's kind of where like British soul stems from. Almost like I, I feel like there's definitely a different frequency between like British soul and American soul. Um. But I definitely wouldn't say it's better. I would say it's on par, but I wouldn't say it's better. I would probably say they're in the same category. I definitely think there's some people who are better than others. Um, for example, like you're gonna talk about British soul, like Sade. Like for me, that's that's the epitome of British soul. For me, sure. for me myself anyway. But I don't know. I think British I I remember saying this to someone not long ago that British R and B artists when like they really go for it like they really go for it like with people like omar and um oh what's their flow at tree obviously sade like i think that they go deep and i think it's a, it's a different level of taking to it with british soul than american soul but american soul is still to me like top tier because it started there really and then it came over like with northern soul and everything so it's to me i don't know american soul is really where it's at to be clear, I didn't I didn't say I didn't cast judgment about one being better than the other, but I I, I am clear that 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 uh, British audiences appreciate American soul music. I feel like more than American audiences do. Oh, well, again, I don't even know that one myself. Like I think that there's definitely a market for it, but what you got to bear England's so small, so mm. it's like a tiny little ripple could look like a huge wave. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I myself personally, I feel like doing R and B isn't like the main thing. Like it's not in the mainstream. Like soul, we kind of like are in the midst of like rap. I think rap definitely more appreciated than R and B over here. And like soul. Hmm. When I think about British soul, I also think about you guys. You don't lock in on R and B uh, or soul as your genre. You have to be in so. Paul Weller sings soul songs, you know, Adele sings soul songs, Amy Winehouse yeah. sang them. I mean, and these people are epic with their ability to, to pull this off. We have Matt Hoy is going to be on the show again soon. Matt sings backup in UB40, but when you give him a microphone, he's like, hey, since George Michael's dead, let me take this work right here. And he fills that space. And there was a yeah. whole lot of soul in Matt. You guys do have something. I think it's just because you're all minge mad. And you're just like trying to get in it. And uh, and so you're like, I can sing my way into some pants? Let me do that. <laughs> you are not wrong, but this is what I mean about British R&B. It's like, not everybody, it's like when we produce something that is immaculate, it is immaculate and there's no argument on it. But it's just not like respected in the way it should be. It's like, for example, Marsha Ambrosius from Floetry. That woman commands so much respect and so much like just everything like she's an incredible artist and she formed so much for r&b on both sides of the atlantic but it's like if i was to talk about her to like people that i know they probably wouldn't even know who she is and that's kind of crazy like to me that that a song like say yes like by floetry is doesn't harbor the same respect in england where you know she's from compared to like in america like when i speak to some of my friends who live out in la and we talk about different songs and different genres and like different artists. If I mention Floetry, they're like, oh my God, say yes. And they'll they'll list the album. But then like British people, they'll be like, yo, who's that? And it's weird. Wow. But, that, but hey, the same uh, thing happens going the other direction. We don't know who Paul Weller is. And you can't be bigger right. than Paul is in UK, you know? And the guys, he's so big, he turns down the night ships. He's like, I don't need that crap. I'm bigger than that. That's a flip. That's such a flex. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of flex, uh, you would know the answer to this question better than anybody else. Is high yellow the commodity in England that it is in the U.S.? Is what? Sorry. High yellow. High yellow. Are you, are you familiar with the concept of high yellow? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. I'm trying to think. I literally don't know if I've ever heard that. 
It's 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 when black people have the cool of being black, but they have caramel colored complexions. That's kind of a big thing here in America. High yellow men and women make a killing. Literally, it, that's so strange because like is that I'm a foreign st- concept to you. Yeah, that like, really is like I've never heard that in my life, like ever. Like I mean, that's that's something I've never heard. Because like, look, gen- if we were in high school together. And we barely knew you. We'd say, bring Vincent, because he's going to make a killing with the ladies, and we'll just catch whatever bounces off of him. We'll catch whatever he can't handle. I mean, that happens. I mean, like, we don't call... I don't even feel like we call it that. Like, I mean, I don't know whether I'm really, like, that aware of it, because I feel like my social circle is... Everyone kind of looks the same. Like, it's funny <laughs> that we all kind of look the same. And, like, normally, whenever I'm, like, out... I'm normally out with family as well. So it's like everyone just kind of looks the same. Okay. I've never really experienced like that. I'm like that's that's blowing my mind, and I feel like that is there is something I ain't gonna forget now. I'll, yeah. What that yeah, is. Put that in the bank because I grew up with a guy named Andre, and we took on everywhere we went with Andre. We'd be like, just hang around with Andre, and then he's gonna get the real, real fine one. But she's got four fine friends. So. Yeah, that's- that's that you are not wrong with them tactics. Like, we know them tactics. We, we, my boys got that one down. We got that one down. There's another artist that is uh, doesn't translate, and you guys actually borrowed, and she's going to be on the show on Friday. Her name is Susie Quattro. She sold, I don't know, 60 million albums over her career, and it's decades long. We don't get her here. She's ours. And the only time yeah, we talk American, about her, lives in London, though. yeah, you have to reference a TV show from the '70s to have anybody go, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, she does play music, huh?" That's where it stops. But she sold 60 million albums. It's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. There's another guy that's like an American guy. I think I always is it Greg Reporter. Oh, I love uh, Greg Reporter. Yeah, yeah. He, he's huge over here. He's not like, big here at all. This is something that I've, I've actually noticed. Like, I remember speaking to, again, somebody else out in on the West Coast, and I was saying, do you know who J- Greg Reporter is? And I was like, I haven't got a clue. And I'm like, yo, this guy is, like, he's huge in, like, the, the adult contemporary scene. Yep. Like, for, like, the more grown-up audience, he's huge. He's from California. And yeah. he plays football. Like, like, our somewhere. football. And we have no idea who he is. Yeah, he's saying it was probably me for Sting at, like, the, the Nordic big award thing you know like they're uh you know they want to recognize art and he sings it and he gets to that soulful part and he, he lets his voice break all over the place and you're like fuck yes yes like there was actual emotion and danger and risk in his love he's so yeah. goddamn i'd love to have him on the show at some point i he's love ridiculously it. talented like i watch like i mean i'm not gonna say that i sit here and listen to his music consistently but whenever like there's a lot of um he does a lot of documentaries on like music like over here like on the bbc and whenever he's on like i will watch that because it, it's so gripping because it feels like you know when you actually talk to someone who knows what they're on about and like you feel like you're being taught like that's what he is and it, his voice just complements everything so when he like throws in and his voice is like oh his voice just feels like christmas like it's so wow. it's so good so his good. voice feels like christmas hey um you know, I know who's influenced you, so I'm going to ask you uh, another hypothetical. If we cast you in a movie and you're playing, a, let's say the veteran singer hands the torch to the young guy who comes up and is just an overwhelming talent, you have to star in the movie, but you also have to collaborate on the soundtrack, okay? And the veteran singer is going to be played by Maxwell. That's exactly who I was thinking oh, about. D'Angelo. Yeah. Raphael Sadiq. Or Kenny Lattimore, which one? Maxwell. Oh, Maxwell. Okay. I was literally listening earlier today. I was listening to the Urban Hangout Suite album. Yeah. That album was impeccable. Uh, yeah. That Classic. And then Ascension into Till the Cops Come Knocking. Yeah. Down to a Science. Yeah. Perfect album. Yeah. Perfect album. That's like what I grew up listening to. Like, well, I grew up listening to like him and like a lot. I grew up listening to a lot of music, but. I remember I literally bought the CD when I was about like 12. I yeah. bought that and the miseducation of Lauren Hill and I listened to them back to back and I was like, yo, this is it. This is so dope. Yeah. What did I hear in it? I heard just a man, like especially with Urban Hangout Suite, I just heard like just soul. Like I heard just unrefined soul that spoke to me because being like growing up where I grew up. So I grew up in like an extreme like, white area so my dad's white 
my mom's black. So like growing up, like I wasn't where I grew up, like there was literally me and two other black people in my year. So like it wasn't until like, I went to like college where I like met other people, but like growing up, there wasn't that much like black representation. And I remember like finding these albums and hearing like an, another black male who can sing. Cause at that point, like there wasn't like a huge representation. There was one guy called Lamar who like literally disappeared off the face of the earth. And he was so talented, but it was like, I remember my mom introduced me to Maxwell. Like, well not actually introduced me, I wish, but like showed me like his music. And I was like, Yo, this is just like the advancement of what I want to create. Like this is, cause I've always known that music is what I wanted to do. So when I heard that, I was like, yo, I know for a fact that I just need to keep going on this path. Yeah. That album too, is where the planets kind of aligned in terms of his composition. The musicianship was great. Sonically, that album was ridiculous. Yes. I mean, you yeah. bought it at the same time as the uh, Miseducation of Lauren Hill, which, of course, groundbreaking, legendary album. But if you just put those two albums next to, to each other sonically, Urban Hang Suite just crushes. Yeah, serious. It's it's so, like, for me, I'm one of them people that whenever I listen to music, I will literally change the EQ on my phone because mm -hmm. I like, have to listen to it. <laughs> like, it's, it's yeah. kind of cool. Like, I literally have, like, well, in this room that I'm in right now, there's like two speakers behind this curtain. There's one in the corner over there. There's another one over there. And each one of them's like kind of plays different. Like I can hear the difference in the sound. So it's like, for example, the speakers behind me is like a loudest rich sound. But the one speaker that I use all the time is just like, if for stuff like that particular album, it's the perfect, it's just the richness. Because I love listening to like sound, like in terms of like literally figuring out like, like different sounds. It was like, I was listening to, um, do you know who Mahalia is? Uh -huh. I was listening to her cover of Eternal Light today and I was just, I was so in deep in it because like, you can just hear every tone and that's the stuff that just gets me so excited about music. So your, uh, your setup there, your speaker setup, like you have your monitor for mixing, like your NS10s behind you and then you have like the, the ones for feeling it, you know, like your big channel X or whatever. Yeah, and then I've got the headphones. I've got like six different pairs of headphones. It's bad. It's, yeah. at this point, it's a slight <laughs> obsession. But like, it's, a, it's an obsession that I'm not like sad about. It's one that I really enjoy. So when you and your bros are hanging out, because I, I, if your friends at all are like friends anywhere else, they don't give a damn how good you are at what you do, and they will absolutely give it to you. You know, like uh, <laughs> my friends call my show the Bake It Brown Show, and they'll ask me if I'm talking about baking tips and stuff like that. You know, and I'm like... Yeah. So what do your friends say to you when you pull out your duffel bag full of headphones? Like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to get my Sade headphones on. They love it because they get to listen to some high quality music because I'm like, yo, whenever I'm with my friends and I'm listening to stuff, I like literally am like transported to a whole other place because I get so deep into it. And I'm like, yo, I'll take out my headphones. I'm like, yo, just listen. And they'll listen to it. And it's like people like really like, it's like my one friend was like, I literally like was listening to some headphones that I had. I think there was, you know what? There was actually my AirPod, my, like the pros. And I was like, yo, I literally felt like I was in the song. And I was like, this is how I feel every day. Like, yeah. it's so important to feel like that because it's just, if you don't, it's the music just misses. And I think that that's what's so important about music. Man, I'm really excited to hear your enthusiasm for sonic qualities and like the transportation mm -hmm. of, you know, and I'm glad that those things inform your writing. Do you lean into life experience in your writing or are you a storyteller who can kind of tell a story that you make up in your head? I'm a bit of both. I um I like to mix the the truth with a lot of a lot of made up stuff. Like I read <laughs> I read a lot so like my imagination does kind of run riot. And then mix with like some of the stuff that I've done like I always say like I know it sounds so morbid but like if tomorrow was the last day I wouldn't mind because at my age at 20 like I've achieved more than a lot of people would ever achieve in a lifetime so it's like I have so much to talk about from like life experience and then added that with like the stories that I've read and the words that I've been like the stories I've been told like I'm surrounded by like a bunch of people who are like like my management team the average age is probably like I don't know for like 40 everyone has so much life experience and it's like the one thing about like my team is that they don't they don't isolate facts from me. 
So it's very, everything's very much shared. So like, I feel like I have so much life experience that I've never even experienced myself, but been told about. So I feel like I can talk about that in songs. That yeah. takes a lot of trust to, to do that, to, to put your art forward through someone else's experience. I mean, that's a mature way to approach this. How do you, how did you develop that? And, and then what else do you need to learn? I mean, you're 20, you don't know the first thing, right? Like the whole world is like, I got some lessons coming. So how do you sort all that out? Honestly, you just don't. You just kind of, every day, you just take it as it comes kind of thing, like when it comes to things like that. Um, but it's, like you say, like I'm only 20. There is so much more to do. But I'm just excited to see what it is that I'll be talking about in like a few years' time when the life experience gets even more and it's more firsthand. Because as I say, at 20, there's only so much I can talk about. But as I like get older... It's like the stories will mature like wine, like it will get better. It will just, it's just going to be, it's an evolution at the end of the day. It's just all about evolution. Yeah. Speaking of your evolution, I mean, you have an artistic evolution that's just really emerging and it's emerging hard. How are your parents enjoying this? So I've been singing about 16, 15 years. The first like live gig I ever did, I was nine. So I was open up for (laughs) Fur At age nine. (laughs) Yeah, you know what I mean? Some of the things that every every nine-year-old does. Right. So, like, they've really seen me, like, develop. And then, obviously, to see me last year go on tour, it's like the like when I can, like, come home and, like, speak to my dad and have, like, those stories about, like, my life. And I speak to my mom. And, and it's, like, the stories that I have are on part of the stories that they have and they're in their 50s. Like, yeah. and they love to see that. Like, they love to see that I'm actually, like succeeding in what i want to do and it's like my older brother he plays soccer like well football over here but soccer and he plays at like a very high standard as well so it's like they're both they're real proud of like both of us which is really nice to see my brother succeed as well as me is like the most humbling experience and it's so dope to see that as well yeah your mom and dad must just be over the moon about you both i heard a story about john taylor from duran duran about how he came to america and became a big pop star and was on mtv and was the biggest star in the universe and he went back to his mom and dad's house and his dad was like you don't get to pick what's on tv man sit down that was <laughs> my family my family don't play games like literally they do not ramp like if they don't want to they will not hold back of what they think it is it's bad. It's ruthless, but it, <laughs> you, it it's terrific. You, gives you very thick skin. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Between the ages of, of nine, where you uh, made a big debut opening for Flo Rida, and, and, and 20, where you are now, what would you say is the most uh, important thing you learned at Ormiston Academy? I think that it was really just being able to know. I think, well, it, that's the, it's a really weird question because – I feel like when I was there, I just had so much fun that I actually forgot that I was, like, learning. Like, I, I'm going to be so real with you. Like, I messed about – because it was two years. I messed around for, pro- like, 18 months of the two years. And then the last bit came, I was like, yeah, I actually need to leave with grades. So, like, I really – but the one thing it really taught me was that I knew that I wanted to do music because it was relentless. Like, every day you would get up, you would practice, you would – you'd be in a space as well where you were not competing, but you were surrounded by like-minded people and everyone's got the same goal. And yeah, really, like, like talented you, people. Yeah, it's like you you really are about to figure out whether you know this is what you want to do or if you're just going to bounce. Like there's so many of my friends who started with aspirations of doing what I'm doing right now, but now they've completely knocked it on the head. They've been like, nah, it's really not for me. Like that's the one thing that I really that place really taught me. Other than like obviously stuff about music, but like in terms of like music performance and what I'm doing now, it taught me that yeah, I actually want to do this. That's, that's probably the most important thing it could have taught you. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That and the light skinned guys get all the chicks. <laughs> Apart from that, that obvious benefit what things have you learned about in terms of the sacrifices you have to make to do it i mean it's all well and good to say i listen to a bunch of music and i sing songs but you and i both know like it's a profession that means that there's no fucking around what do you have to do that you had no idea like this is actual work it's as you say it's the sacrifices that you take like i don't know for me because i've been doing it for so long now like when i say for so long i mean i took a long time out to focus on school 
Like that was my thing, like from the age of like nine till well, sixteen. I wasn't messing around with music really. Like I was practicing, but it was on the back burner. What it's really been like for me in terms of I've literally feel like I forgot my you know when you lose your train of thought, mid thought. Uh, that's just what's happened to me. What was the question again? <laughs> I like literally just in general the sacrifice. What are those sacrifices? The sacrifices, to be honest, it's like obviously the the, the obvious ones are like social, like your social stuff. Um, and another thing as well is like weirdly enough, it's like a financial thing as well because going into like an industry like this, it's so dynamic that one day you are wanted and the next day you're not. So it's like you have to kind of just figure it out and be able to be. Be able to sit still. That's probably the, the the biggest thing you learn. But that's from all the sacrifices you have to take. And it's like, it's so difficult to narrow it down to what a sacrifice is because it's constant. Like you have so many of them. Do you know what I mean? Like you, there's never just one avenue of sacrifice because sacrifice could literally be anything at any moment. Like there's been multiple times where I've literally been out and I've had to leave like in a moment's notice or there's there's like events that I've missed out on and there's there's like so much stuff that like you miss and you don't get to see and experience and no doubt with what I want to achieve it's going to be more uh, there's going to be more of that but it's all part of what you want it's like the sacrifices that you take are the rewards you are going to gain but let me push you on this whole thing too because we've had a lot of uh, very seasoned acts on we've had Sly Stone who has been through all of it uh, we had mm-hmm. Allie Willis, who can write a song, or when she was with us, could write a song as good as anybody has ever written a song. And once the industry realized that, they saddled her up, and they, they took it to her. You know, like, they didn't let up for as long as she could take it. And they literally wrung every song they could out of her. You know I mean? And that's going in, you're like, yeah, I want to write songs for a living and be a Hall of Famer. Well, she got to be that. But, it, you know, once they realize you're a commodity that can make everybody money, you don't get to say no. When, you're, when your exactly. brother gets married, you're like, I am not going to be there. I'm going to exactly. be in Hollywood where I hate to be in traffic recording music. It, but that's just it. It's like, I feel like you have to be aware that that is what you are about to get into. I think that if you don't sit there and think, yo, this is actually the career path that you're about to take. And you know for a fact that these are things that you might have to do. Then it, you, I just don't think you should be in a position to do it. Like if you feel like obviously stuff like that would be horrible, but it comes with the territory that you walk. It's one of them. Yeah, the more romantic notion of that story is to say that you are entrusted with the responsibility of seeing the world through a particular lens and showing it to the rest of us. And in order to do that, you um, have to make the sacrifices that you talk about. So it's like it's incumbent on you because we're depending upon you to go experience things differently than, than the normal people do so that you can reflect those things back to us. Does that resonate with you at all at age 20? Yeah, no, completely. Like, I think that that is really what songwriting is. It is like literally regurgitating experiences for other people. This is why I talk about like reading, for example, like I read quite a lot of of, like autobiographies because like I've ordered, um, I've ordered like another book and I'm who, I don't even remember who it was. I read, Richard Branson's like autobiography. Like I'm never going to be in Richard Branson's position. Like I'm not going to be running Virgin, but the the reading them stories allows me to have that what he had. Like in case I'm ever in that position, so it's like I feel like if you fill up your head with those stories, you can get them out, even if it's stuff you haven't experienced as well. Yeah, and you never know what you're putting away for later, because clearly you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. And those things will inform stuff that you do much later in ways that you can't imagine now. Exactly. Exactly. This is what it's all about, like planting the seeds, if you like, to grow the tree. Because you can't you can't get to the top of anything without putting in the hard work. And that's why I refer to it as like planting the seeds, because that's what this is. It's planting the seeds because it is a long haul career that I want. And the best way to get that is by doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Who writes profound songs to you right now? Who Who's communicating to you in a way that's on a different level? Leanne Le Havis. Definitely. Okay. Off the bat, Leanne Le Havis. I don't know what it is about that woman, but she is the most, in, like, the most, I just, I, there's no words for it. Like, 
and this is what I mean about British soul. Like, you know how you're talking about British soul artists before, like they're like in another level. This woman, honestly, to me, is the creme de la creme of what British soul is right now to me, like in the mainstream, well, mainstream-ish, but it's like she doesn't have that recognition, but like her voice, her guitar playing skills, the writing, it's everything is just so incredible. And it's the top tier right now for me. There's obviously other artists, but she's right there. Are you concentrating on live performance right now? I mean, do you have a band and a musical director? Are you working hard to prepare for touring once that becomes a thing again? We, yeah, like we are. I think it's something that we're always aware of. Like I'm always practicing. And because I'm very like musically orientated, like I don't really have like an MD, so to speak. Like I work with like this one guy in Canada a lot. His name is Gray Hawkins. So he's the guy who produce will produce everything for me. Well, not everything, but everything that I've put out so far. So him and I, we kind of split stuff up. But because the way that my head works like musically, I really like to be involved in like the MD side of it. Mm. It's real difficult to like be in that position. But I have some like shows coming up over here in like a few weeks. So it's like we're gonna slowly start getting back into like the swing of practicing because really I haven't been able to do that in a band form. And it's like, as you said about a band as well, it's like the people who I like normally work with are out in Canada because that's really where I spend the most of my musical time. I have like some people over here that I work with, but it's just about getting like that right blend. I feel like 75% there with them, but like I have to develop that extra little bit as well. When it comes to those uh, extra little bits, you, you got to work with, um, I don't know if you know Wes, maybe he's probably your neighbor. You probably went into him at some point, but as an engineer, as a producer, their job is to get you to go that extra spot. Have you become adept at being pushed beyond your comfort zone when you're standing in front of that microphone behind the glass? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Have you become adept at being pushed beyond your comfort zone when you're standing in front of that microphone behind the glass? Proper. The guy who I like, Gray Hawken, he's relentless when it comes to taking vocals. Like we literally, because I'm I'm a stickler for like I don't like having any kind of augmentation on my voice. Like I hate it. I you hate it. Back. By the way, you don't need it at all. <laughs> so that's Thank smart. You. Thank you. Like I hate it. Like I I can't listen to music. Well, I can, but I really don't like listening to music that I can hear augmentation. Like I can hear literally the splice in like the audio track. Like when or to, like when people like melodyne things and i think that's what it's called is melodyne that's the one where like they get it bang on i can literally hear like the roboticness of it and i hate it the guy who i do like a lot of stuff with he knows that so because he knows that he drills out it's oh my gosh we could be there for an hour getting one good take but it's like to be honest i'm so used to it at this point that yeah, excellent that's good yeah, because excellent. we uh, there's a great story that Exhibit tells about working with Dr. Dre, you know, and like yeah. if you're a young guy like you and you come in, you know, and you sing the line and you're like, perfect, I can't sing it better than that. And Dr. Dre goes, do it again. Do it again. This, this is just it. It's like you it could again. literally do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And it's, like, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, being in that position, like, I can only imagine how like stressful that is. But because I'm so used to like literally recording one word 150 times that I don't even have that concept in my head that I can do a one take. This is a good discriminator because he does that in part to see like what you have in the tank. And part of it is like, you know what? I need to take a break. It'll be like, and then Dr. Gray will say these words to you. I'll be right back. And he ain't coming back. <laughs> and he never comes back. <laughs> no. I would the same way. Like on a real, like when I'm old, like when I'm older and I'm like getting like new people through like that because at the end of the day you should it's a level of of like persistence to your craft and i think it's that's what splits like musicians from singers because i feel like a musician anybody who will know like who plays an instrument you will sit there and you will play until it is perfect there's no oh it's all right we can leave it and i think to be honest, the voice is no different to any other instrument and i believe that when it's played or sang it needs to be done perfectly 
that's my MO and that's how I was always around music. Yeah. I love that we're talking about discipline and sacrifice and, you know, purity with a guy who's 20. Tell us about Gray Hawken and what it's like working with him and how he brings the best out of you. What do you think he does for your songwriting? What demands does he put on your standard of quality? I think what it is with him, he's one of the first people that I've like really met in my life who's like the same as me musically. I'm not saying the same part because he's ridiculously talented. I would be undershooting if I was to say I'm on his level. Like this guy is, you could put, you. He's incredible. Like any instrument, he'll play it. He's one of those people. Because when I'm surrounded by people who I perceive as better than me, I try to step up to their level. And that's what he does for me. Like he helps me find new things within like my way of thinking because I want to be on par to the to him. And it would be like the same thing as if I'm in a room with like, as you said earlier, Dr. Dre. It's like, I want to be on to the people who I am around. Like, And I think that that's how it should be. And it's like, in years to come, when people come to studios with me, I want people to sit there and be like, yo, I need to be on par with him. So it's like, the way that you start is the way you finish. And I feel like you, you always go in at the level that you want to be at. Nice. Yeah. So you worked with him in, in uh, Jamaica, right? Yeah, in 2016 or 2017. I wow. Wanted- I can't really remember. It was the Were first time I ever... God damn it, yo. <laughs> Holy shit. No, I was, I was 17. If it was 2016, I was 17. Well, I, was either, I think I was, was I 16. I was 16 at the time. So it was 2017 and I was 16. Yeah, and it was crazy. I remember we literally... we I was staying out in Ocho Rios and we was recording in Kingston. And my mom, obviously being from Jamaica, um, my... Like when we was going to the studio, my mom was like getting ready to come with us. My manager was like, yo, nah, it's cool. Like you don't need to come. My mom just looked him in the face and was like, yo, I grew up here. There is no way my 16 year old son right. is going to talk them by himself. And then my manager was like reassuring my mom was like, yo, don't worry. Like he's with me. It's cool. Like whatever. And then she was cool with it. But at this point, literally in this car, I didn't know anybody. I knew I knew my manager and there was like eight, there was seven people in this car. I knew one person and it was the funny story about all of it was we was driving on this highway and the wheel fell off the car. I didn't know, yeah. The wheel literally rolled off of the car. Like we was driving and out there it just went like this and was like, whoa. But it was, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was an event, but it was incredible. You know, like working out in Kingston at 16, like going to Jamaica was mad. And then literally a few minutes later, I went to I went to Canada for the first time. And I've just been going back ever since, like back and forth. Tell us about the experience, though, of working in Jamaica, because at that age, you know, you're feeling around for your artistic sensibilities. And then you get to to, a you know, to a large degree, go home in a sense and work from home. And what was that like? It was immense. It, it really was. It was like. I don't know. I feel like when you're in a space like that, you really take like appreciation for everything. It was like, I'd never really been to like proper studios before. Like I'd been to like some studios, but never really went anywhere on the scale of Big Yard, which is where we recorded. Yeah. I remember like pulling up and like they opened the gates and I was like, yo, this is like a compound and being in a different country. It was like, it was, it was the, the thought of, yo, someone really, really writes me to the fact that they think that this is the place where I should be recorded because there's millions of other record record studios in Jamaica. I mean, like, look at the volume of people and artistry from Jamaica alone. Such a tiny place, but so much comes out of it. So there's all these studios. So to be going to this studio where it was so... It made me feel so authoritative and it made me know that I was definitely doing music for the right reasons. And then... But like the next day when was at the studio to meet Beanie Man was like wow. mind blowing. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it was it was incredible. So it was like as you say, to go home almost and then to get to experience everything that I did and get to like create what I got to create was just it it's something that I will never forget. And, you, and never forget. When you go to these established studios, you know, they, they all have these incredible histories. So and so saying into this microphone. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I went to go record in the village in Hollywood, 
and it's like Smashing Pumpkins, Dr. Dre, Heart. Like it's relentless, and, and it's like they're like they've had so many incredible albums. There's no more room on the wall to go like hey, the, all these things have been made here. Mm-hmm. I believe, as a guy who's not a performer, you can feel that when you walk in. This wood is alive, and it's got this this inspiration in it. If you can draw from it, you're shaking your head. Yes, so I'm going to shut up. I want to hear about what you think about that. It's it's true what you're saying. It's like, for example, we um we moved from so um Big Yard Studios up the road with Mix Lab Studios, and at Mix Lab Studios where like they recorded what well, literally is weird. You say this about like the the people around because I can only remember one person because it blew my mind because there was like stickers on like the door of like the people who worked there. And I remember seeing Murder, She Wrote by Shaka Demas and Pliers. And that just blew my mind. Like, I remember just sitting on the cat, like, on the sofa, being like, there is no way that this re- this song was, like, incepted in this room, created, recorded, and what I hear now, and literally we're recording stuff for my my music here. Like, it was, it was incredible. It was, like, a different level of, like, inspiration that you dig from it's it's crazy yeah you got to bring it proper you can't you can't be like less than these people this is what i mean like earlier about when you're in those positions you have to be up to scratch with everyone who's been through them doors because it's like even like for example the sound engineer say sound engineer works for the studio they see so many people so like you have to show that you are as good if not better than those people too Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You have a standard to live up to. You can't let your forebears down. You know, it's almost like they are handing you the torch. It's your turn. You got to bring something. And there are some mm-hmm. big hands on that torch. Like Johnny yeah. Cash loved Jamaica. He lived there. He had a house. He walked around Ocho Rios and he's like, I got a song to write, you know, and he wrote worried man, like inspiration like that. That guy's got his hand on the torch. And there is no bigger hand than Johnny Cash. I mean, he monolithic in his impact in music. Does that at all keep you up at night? I mean, what what does keep you up at night? You're so young. Does anything keep you up at night besides girls? (laughs) You know what? I don't know. I feel like for me, my thing is really, as I say, like I want a serious career, like a real serious, serious career. And that's what kind of keeps me up at night. It's like, it's the idea of knowing that I can create a future for my grandkids right at the age of 20 that's what gets me excited like knowing that i can secure so many generations of my family by doing what i love that's what really keeps me up at night to be honest it, not everyone gets the opportunity to do what i do it's and to take them for granted it would be it would be, be stupid and that's what really keeps me up at night man it's like knowing that I'm really solidifying like the next steps. Cause not only for me, cause my thing is about reformation of what is going on right now, especially in England with R and B, because I want, I want to be able to turn around in like 10 years and had the same effect that Drake had on Toronto, like how Toronto was a city that no one, everyone knew of, but was not a city that was seen as respected until this Canadian, you come out singing up his songs, just hold up. We're going home. And, all of these songs and then it comes out of nowhere and then everybody the world's eyes are on toronto and any talent that comes out of that city is perceived as the next thing that's what i want to do but for my hometown of birmingham that is what i will do and that's what keeps me awake okay if you're birmingham's drake who's birmingham's russell peters (sighs) i don't know (laughs) More serious question. This sense of responsibility that you have, man, is amazing. And it's great to hear because you do have some tremendous tools and we're really looking forward to what you bring. What does a serious career look like for you? If you map it out 10 years from now, what are the things that you're looking to accomplish and how do you do something different and carve a path that belongs to you that's different from a path that, say, Ozzy carved? It's creating different levels of history. That's what I want to do. I want to create history. I don't see the point in doing this for any other reason. Yeah. I, I literally, I was, I was at, I probably, and I think about it now and I'm surprised my manager didn't kill me. But like, I remember being in like a meeting, like a really important meeting. And I literally remember saying to like this person, I was like, I'm not even fussed about being famous. Like my thing is this, is that 
I don't want no low level of fame. If I'm going to do this, like I want to create so much history that like that there's nothing else for anybody else to do at this point. That's what I want to be synonymous with. So like it's either all or nothing. Like you were either, and I remember saying to this person, like either it's going to be the most crazy level of fame or it's just not going to be that. I don't see the point in trying halfway for it. Like I wasn't brought up as a halfway kind of person. It was you either do what you're doing with your full ability, you go for it with full stride, or you just don't bother. It's the same reasons why my brother's in the position he's in, same reason I'm in the position that I'm in. It's not it's not allowing half to be good enough. It's yeah. all on the Wow. We I heard a neat story from Chaz Palminteri, the filmmaker. He's from uh Hoboken. He's from Hoboken. Well, Frank Sinatra is also from Hoboken. So he always wanted to meet Frank Sinatra. And when he finally did, he said, Mr. Sinatra, I'm also from Hoboken. And Frank Sinatra said, congratulations, kid. You'll always be the second most famous guy from Hoboken. Oh, God. <laughs> I think about it from time to time, like in my head, like it's like that is so true, like on so many different levels. Like, are you going to be the most famous person from that place? Like that is something that I think about. Like I'm like, am am I gonna be that person? Like, will I? And I think, yeah, maybe, maybe after Ozzy Osbourne, maybe I think he's probably the only person who could probably say that to me when I get what I want out of this. I feel hey, like we love Ozzy, but you know what? He's not gonna be around forever. Yeah, someone's got to pick up that title. I mean, Everybody's got to pick it up. Yeah, that's right. Well, and before you you get your dirty grubby paws on his title, you also got to get by UB40. And- <laughs> Exactly what I was just about to say. There's also UB40. It's like I was really lucky to actually get to meet them the once at uh, after party. It was the weirdest scenario of my entire life. Like it was, it was like in Birmingham we have an award show, like a Birmingham Music Awards, and one of my friends won an award, so we went to the after party. I literally at this point I think I had like seven Jaeger bombs, and I felt absolutely awful. I thought I was gonna like yak everywhere. I went into the toilets, and I was like four members of UB40 just chilling. And I was like, <laughs> well, I saw these people on stage like an hour ago. And my mind just wasn't like, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. It was crazy. Have you? So yeah. I want, I to, want to say you, at that, that, that point you were up, 11. You're going to meet certain people. They're going to be like, oh, oh, we got to meet this kid, Vincent. Let me, you know, get me his number. And so maybe Tommy Iommi calls you, or maybe it is Ozzy that calls you. Who's who would you say the moment this person calls me, I'll know that like I've really done something huge. Who who from Birmingham do you want to hear from? You're like that will put the flag and be like that. I never thought would happen, and here it is. I'm anointed. Yeah. You know what? And this is no disrespect to any artist from my city because everyone's so talented. But the problem is this: it's that Birmingham's synonymous with rock. I'm not trying to be a rock star. I'm an yeah. R&B singer. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know my name. And I don't really think that there's anybody from my city who could pass that title to me, to be honest. Like, there probably might be. Like, I know, for example, um, there's some people that carry that title. It's like, if anything, in terms of like an R&B bubble, Boy George is probably a closer thing than anyone. But it's like, for me, if I was to get a phone call off one British artist... And that would be the moment for me to be like, yeah, that serious would be Sade, hands down, because that woman is a blueprint. Like she is a just when I say blueprint, I mean blueprint for ev- not everything that I do. But in terms of like the way that she she could command this whole decade and of like everyone's life and literally created a soundtrack that was just so detailed, so beautiful. And then literally just said, you know what, deuces, I'm going to bounce and live the rest of our life just in complete obscurity. Like that to me is own terms. the most incredible thing in the world. Like, and I mean, Adele's cool because Adele could probably do the same thing. But Sade is Sade. And is Sade, I, I don't know how old she is right now, probably what, 50s, 60s. If she was to say like, yo, I'm going to go on tour, that's going to sell out in moments. That's oh, yeah. what I want to be able to dictate after what the last time she probably done anything was like 2008 i think like that's what i really do you know what i mean that that's serious that's a serious career yeah that's a great answer to that question that is a serious career it's done on her own terms 
Yeah. She had, like you said, complete command, not only of a decade of music, but of a decade of our emotions. Yeah. And then at, at a moment's notice, you're right. She could call up a tour and not only would everybody raise their hand to play on that tour, but it would sell out in moments. Exactly. Exactly. It would it'd be the most incredible thing ever. Yeah. That's great, man. It's refreshing, actually, to hear that these are your aspirations because you don't expect to hear somebody who's keep harping on 20 years old. But it's not even the fact that you're 20. It's just that you're emerging in your career the way that you are and you already have such clarity in what you want to accomplish. So I just not even a question. I just want to say right on, man. That's awesome. It's because I've always known what I wanted to do. I think that it's it's one of them ones that when you know what you want to do, there's no there's no like distraction. It's like it's like you know when you're on a night out and you see like the finest girl in the bar, like you know that that's what you want. It does no one else is going to get in the way, and that's what this is for me. It's it's that I know as well that I can achieve what I want. It's like especially you know like when you see this person like that girl and you're like, yo, like we can definitely that's get up level. Like you are on my level and I'm yeah. on your this is what music is for me like there's to me there's no room also the universe needs like, this yeah it does like people need fight and talk fight yeah. and talk is needed I don't care what anybody says affirmations putting it out there you need to you can't sit there and say oh I'd like to I don't know whether I would you straight up got to say yeah gonna do that because that's how I managed to tour America because I remember as a kid I used to be like yo this would be the craziest thing in the world to tour America last year 19 years old, had no business in being any of the bars that I was in, but I toured America. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, that's what it is. Yeah. Let, let me take this the other direction. Let me say that the fates, the fates don't give you all of Birmingham and you have a career like Kevin Rowland. And I don't know if you even know who Kevin Rowland is, but if you're a musician and you're fronting Dexy's Midnight Runners and you get one incredible song and then a career of music, that's pretty, like he still wins, you know, like maybe it hasn't been financially easy, but Kevin Rowland will always get a check for writing, you know, come on Aline and, and it plays every day throughout the world. It's fantastic success. Would that be enough? Truthfully, no. Okay. Truthfully, no. Because <laughs> it's cool. It's cool, but I'm, I, I don't want to say that they're a commodity because they're not, because that come on Aline is a serious song, like serious and nobody can take that away from them. But to me, that's not the career that I want at all. Like my career, I don't want to be outshined by a song. I want, when people think of me, they don't think of the song. They think of the career that I had. The same way with Sade. You don't think of, you might, yeah, granted, you might think of smooth. Between you think of 11 songs. Yeah, at least. We're not all going to think of one song. We, yeah. between the three of us, you could be in a room with probably about 20 people and everybody could say, name your favorite Sade song. Nobody's going to say the same song. Whereas you say that about Dixie's Midnight Runners, everyone's going to say, come on, Eileen, that's not the career that I want. That's not the, the success that I want. It's a cool success. But same time, that guy also lives next door to my cousin's fiance. So, and they live like, another ca like a casual street somewhere not too far from here. So I, that's not what I want at all. At all. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, love I don't think we're going to have that problem. I don't think uh, anybody's going to say, you remember that song, Still Here We Are? You you, you know Vincent Darby. You've ever heard of Vincent Darby? You're like, motherfucker, Vincent, what do you mean have I ever heard of Vincent Darby? <laughs> well, that's you know how many funny. times that guy's got me laid? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. But nah, that's how it's got to be, man. It's serious. Like, There's no two which way about it for me. Like, It's all or nothing. That's why it is with my music as well. Like, I could happily just, I could half-heartedly sing my songs. Happily. Believe me. Happily. It would make my life easier when it comes to recording. But I, I don't see the point. You do it or you just don't. Not that uh, you need my advice as a 50-year-old man who's not a performer, but here is my advice. And this, is, this comes from my combat side. Anytime you can create a song that will get people laid or, may, or have it become their yeah. song, you should write one of those. Like, I don't care what else I do. This song will get people in love, you know, because what, so what I would work uh, in combat zones, but if I had the chance and I met with the team ahead of time, I would try to get everyone on that team laid that night. I'd be introducing them to hot chicks and all that kind of thing. Cause that's how I became valuable to them. They realized that was about them. 
And if yeah. you can find that magic with what you do, you're like, I, I defy someone to not have sex after hearing this song. Like, think about the guys who really do this well. Put it this way, yeah, I have those songs. Like, I genuinely have those songs. Like, I mean, I'm very, very, very particular on who hears my music, like, before it's released. But literally everybody that, like, my friends who have heard, like, this one specific song, and even, like, my brother, I remember my brother said to me the once, he was playing the song in the car. My brother's, like, my biggest critic. He does not hold back. If he doesn't like something, I'm going to find out, and he won't hold back about it. I remember this one song, like he listens to it a lot and he goes to me, he goes, I'm so irritated that it's you that sings this because if this song was to ever come out, like when like he's, you know, like fucking, he would go mad. Like he, he literally was like, he's like, <laughs> the perfect song for it, but it's just too weird. Yeah. And it's, even my other friends like tell me about like, literally, I remember when I released Get Away, which was the first thing I ever released. The amount of messages that I have saying, yo, I had sex to your song last night. I was like, good for hey, you. That's good a winner. For you. That's good a winner. For you. That's what it was, man. But it was, it was what it is. Like, and I ain't mad about it because at the end of the day, if you're listening to my music while you're fucking and it's a great experience, then I'm glad that I'm involved in that great experience. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to give that a shot, but I'm going to feel a little bit dirty that you were like 16 when you recorded that song. <laughs> But technically it's legal it's cool it's cool it's cool yeah. you also can be earlier in the process you know like just you know start with like a kiss song or a looking in her eyes song and then you know get him dancing with that girl get him the courage yeah. you know i mean the gap band yeah. did that you know they, they sang they, they got you on the dance floor before and yeah. then they kind of like now we'll leave it up to you you know you don't got to be in the room necessarily yeah, no, of course, of course. I, I definitely agree with that because I, I definitely don't want to be in the room and never the bed. That's not my business. That's, that might be for some people that ain't for me. So they got but their like, headphones on. They're bumping yeah. and grinding. You're like, yeah. It's a bit weird. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, it's true. I think it's all about setting the scene. And that's what it is. That's what songwriting is. That's what music should be. It's setting that scene. It's allowing, like, the world to be in, in that moment that you created. I think that that's what great songwriting is it's it's like creating that evolutionary like place that like everybody knows without ever like without telling the story the same way that everyone else has i think that that's something and that's something as well that i think that i'm actually all right at doing which helps yeah well hey man we are uh definitely engaged we want to help whatever we can to you know get your get your voice out in front of as many of our friends as we can uh as we can get it out to and we appreciate like i said the fact that we've able to we were able to have conversations with somebody who's as early in your career as you were and conversations about sacrifice and clarity and all of the things that you mentioned um you know, in terms of where you want to go and how you want to command your career. And uh, so I applaud, man. I'm, I'm a fan. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. I do appreciate that. Thank you. I want to say uh, for everybody looking on the screen right now, if you're watching, uh, you can see the link to Vincent's Spotify account. You can listen to the songs there. In general, go to the website. The link is up. If you're listening on the podcast side, look in the show notes. Definitely. If you're always looking for new music, here we go. Here's a guy that's super talented. Here's my flag. I'm going to plant for you. When you're singing soul songs with Daryl Hall on Live from Daryl's House, I'm going to be like, oh, man, that kid has made it. Because if you're singing Sarah Smile with him and, and whatever songs you bring to the table at that point, that's Apex performance. I mean, it doesn't get better than that because that guy, nobody's more soulful. Nobody's, that guy has over a dozen songs that are in like the top five on the hit charts, you know, just singing and getting people laid and pouring that love out. So that's the hope. That's what I hope to see is you saying it across to him going, I can't believe I'm singing with Daryl Hall, you know? Man, that's exactly how it's got to be. Yeah, yeah. you're going to sing Sarah Smile with him, and he's going to sing Getaway with you. And you're going to be like, damn, no one's sang my song like that before, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> Terrific. Our guest today has been Vincent Darby, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, if you're listening on the podcast side, that's great. Go in the show notes. Check out all the links to Vincent's stuff. Everybody, be early on Vincent Darby. You won't regret it. <laughs>